Once there were two Aggie engineering students who dreamed, <laughs> you're not going to like this, who dreamed up a plan to travel to the sun. Their University of Texas friends told them that it was impossible because as they got closer and closer to the sun, they would eventually burn up because the sun was so hot. Well, the Aggie engineers looked at each other and they said, we've already thought this out. We're going to travel at night. <laughs> give it up. Jokes like the one, <laughs> yeah, I should give it up. Jokes like the one I just told, they're common everywhere. In fact, I grew up in Iowa. I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and we would tell the same joke, but we wouldn't use Aggies. We would use people from a Polish uh, descent in that. And when you think about it, you can, you can insert just about any distinction in, in any of these jokes that, that we tell. How do you get a Baylor grad off of your front porch? This is for Joe Cook. You pay them for the pizza. <laughs> I know, they're all alike. That's a, the, <laughs> now, we can start doing karaoke and telling Aggie jokes, but I'm not going to do that. The purpose of the jokes is for the joke teller to have a sense of superiority over the person that is the target of the, gro the joke. The purpose that is that in some way you feel sort of superior to the Aggies because you just told an Aggie joke. People do all kinds of things in order to have a sense of superi superiority over others. In grand terms, we don't have to look too far back. When we look into World War II, we look at Adolf Hitler and the Nazi governor, government. The Nazis made a pledge to create a superior race, the Aryan race, a pure ethnic line that would be established forever. Of course, in order to maintain a pure ethnic race, other more inferior races had to be eliminated. And they had a system for that. They called it the final solution, which led to the murder of six million Jews alone, almost two-thirds of the population, the Jewish population of Europe. This does not include a quarter of a million persons with disabilities that were killed and a quarter of a million Roma or gypsies that were killed, all in a quest for superiority. The reason I'm making a, a reference to the Holocaust is because the German, uh, the German, the Nazis were very unique in the way that they did this. They actually created a bureaucratic structure in order to uh, carry out killings in such a massive, almost industrial scale. So I ask, why did the Germans, why did the German officers follow through on these horrible orders? Why did the German people not stop the genocide that was happening? As some communities were right there on the rail lines and people were unloaded from the trains and then they disappeared, they didn't know where they went. How, why didn't they do something about it? Well, it's a, it's a feeling that's rooted in each one of us. It's that same feeling when we believe, well, not quite, but it's the same feeling when we believe that the Aggies are superior to somebody else, another college, or that we feel that Methodists are superior to Baptists, which I truly believe, or when we feel, <clears throat> that's not really true, or when we believe that Americans or Texans are bigger, smarter, and more creative than anyone else on earth. The fact is, we are no, I thought I'd get a response there. The fact is that we are no better and we are no worse than any other person who has ever lived or is living today. We all have the potential to be either president or pauper. We all have the, the potential to be either priest or penitent. The need for superiority comes from within ourselves so that we can justify ourselves as better or greater than another person. Jesus was traveling with the disciples from uh, Judea to Galilee. Jesus had been in Jerusalem. In uh, John, this happens very early in John, John, Jesus drives the money changers out of the temple, and he was baptizing more people than his cousin ever did. So Jesus was causing a stir in Jerusalem. And in the book of John, as I said, it happens in chapter 3, which is very early in the book of John, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. So Jesus gathers his disciples together and heads back home. He heads back to Galilee away from the hustle and the bustle of the attitudes of the city. Now, we know that country people don't have the same attitudes as city people, don't we? That makes us better, right? Wrong. That's not. It just makes us different. Jesus took a rather unique route, and I, I'm going to try and show this to, to you. Normally, Jewish people, when they were traveling from, uh, from Galilee, up around in here, there's the Sea of Galilee, and they were traveling to Jerusalem, which is down here, 
they would normally go this route. They would go to the, they'd cross the Jordan River, go to the Transjordan, and go down here and come in at Jericho, and then travel up, whoop, up to Jerusalem. They did that so they could avoid Samaria. Samaria is that green circle. Jesus instead, and you could do this even in ancient times, you could stay, you could leave from a Jewish city in uh, Judea, and you could travel through Samaria and get to a Jewish city at night. So you didn't have to stay overnight if you didn't want to in Samaria. Jesus was traveling with his disciples from Judea to Galilee. <clears throat> the reason that people would avoid Samaria has a historic reason. And the origin of the Samaritans goes back to 586 B.C. with the Babylonian exile. When the Babylonians breached the walls of Jerusalem, the temple was looted, then burned, and the royal family was led off into exile in Babylon. The Babylonians were brutal and were one of the first conquering empires to practice, a, uh, to practice what is called mass deportation, where they would remove masses of people, of the people that lived there, and then they would replace them with people from the other countries, from other lands that were loyal to Babylon. It was a way of keeping the peace for uh, the Babylonian Empire. Now, they didn't take everybody from, from Israel to Babylon. They, who do you think they would take? They took the royal family, of course, because they were the rulers. Then they, they could pick and choose whoever they wanted to deport. They would take the people that could read, which meant the priests. They could take people that uh, were artists, sculptors, people that had value to their economy. Those are the people that they would take to Babylon. And who did they leave behind? They would leave the poor, the subsistence farmers, the uneducated. They would leave the people of the least amount of worth. Now, the Babylonian exile lasted for about 50 years. And after that, uh, Persians, the Persians under Cyrus the Great, conquered the Babylonians, and Cyrus became the emperor. Cyrus took the throne, and he allowed the Jews to return. All of this time, for 50 years, for a generation, the Jews in exile remained pure, undefiled from the influence of a foreign land. The book of Daniel talks about uh, the, the Babylonian exile. They reworked the sacrificial system because they couldn't do sacrifices. They decided that the greatest sacrifice that a person could do was to study the Torah and to embody the Torah in their life as best as they possibly could. So they would study the Torah, and they had little places where you could go to study the Torah together. And then there were people that spent more time studying the Torah, and they became the teachers. And so those people that became the teachers became the rabbis. And the places where they would go and they would study the Torah became the synagogues. And so that whole system developed in the Babylonian exile. They worked hard to maintain a distinct identity as a people who are called out by God for a sacred task, to be a sacred, chosen people. And when Cyrus issued his edict so that, that allowed the Jews to come back to uh, Israel, those who returned found that it had been left behind. Those that had been left behind had done a couple of things that, you know, their, their whole, the people that were left, all they did was try to get by and get along. And so what did they do over 50 years? They got by and they got along. They intermarried with the people brought in from the other lands. The gene pool was not clean. They had done nothing to restore the temple. They hadn't done anything except get by and get along. And if you read the book of Ezra, you see, even see some friction between these two groups, so much that as he consecrated the temple in Jerusalem after they rebuilt the temple, Ezra prayed this in his prayer. The land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Ezra was talking about the Samaritans. And now, 500 years later, in the time of Jesus, this bias still existed so much that Jews would avoid traveling through Samaria on their way from Galilee to Jerusalem. It's just a 23-mile difference, but it's quite a difference in altitude, all because of a sense of superiority. You could travel through Samaria in one day, leaving from a Jewish village in the morning and ending in a Jewish village at night. So the issue wasn't so much about getting stuck in Samaria. The issue was about having any contact with Samaritans. 
The issue was feeling superior to other people. We can assume that Jesus decided to get back to Galilee rather quickly. And so Jesus chose this more direct route. They stop at a well at a place called Sychar, which uh, scholars believe to, uh, to actually be ancient Shechem. So they had made some good, uh, they'd made some good distance by the time they came to Shechem. Jesus and the disciples stop at a well at the city water supply at midday, and there Jesus met a Samaritan woman. In ancient Palestine, nobody goes to the well in the middle of the day. Everybody, all of the women would go to the well in the morning because that's when they're starting to cook, and they would go in the morning because it was cooler in the morning, and they would talk, and they would get their water in the cool of the day. So we know that someone coming to the well in the middle of the day, that something's not right. A conversation ensues between Jesus and the woman. Jesus says, please give me a drink. She said, why are you, a Jew, even talking to me, a Samaritan and a woman? And Jesus replies with a messianic illusion that he would give her living water. The Samaritan woman totally misses the point and thinks that by living water, Jesus isn't making a spiritual reference, but he's talking about a stream, a running stream, a stream, that, a water that moves instead of a well. So she tells Jesus, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than my ancestor Jacob? And Jesus then tries to restate his messianic point. And this is what he said. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. It will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And Jesus is quoting out of the Psalms in this. She said, I'll have some of that. Because if I have some of that, then I won't have to come back to this well anymore. And Jesus said, go call your husband and uh, have him come back here. She said, I have no husband. He said, you're right. You have had five husbands, and the one you're with right now is not your husband. I can see at this point the woman's eyes widening. And uh, so she said, ah, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Whoa, you know all this about me. How do you know all this about me? I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she tries to change the subject. It's just a wonderful story. She said, uh, say, let me ask you a theological question. We uh, Samaritans worship God here on Mount Gerizim, and you worship God in Jerusalem. Who's right? Jesus said, The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. What Jesus is saying is that the one who's standing before you, the one who is sitting at the well with you right now, is the one that's going to change everything. And if you believe in me, all distinctions vanish. Jesus is saying, when it comes to God, all distinctions end. When it comes to God, all faces will turn to God and worship him because God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. As Christians, that moment that one becomes water washed at baptism and, and when the Spirit comes down at confirmation, we become one and all distinctions melt away. I want to close with a story that tells you a little bit about where I was last week. For, um, I've, been, I've been going out to West Texas with this group of clergy for the past 15 years and uh, we decided that we would go somewhere different this year to celebrate the organizer and my birthdays this year. We're, gonna, we're going to be 60 this year. He said, I want to climb Gua Guadalupe Peak. For those of you that don't know, well, wait, I'm going to see how many hands. How many of you know where Guadalupe Peak is? Oh, many of you do. It's the highest point in Texas. It's at about, uh, about 9,000 feet. So uh, we decided that we were going to climb Guadalupe Peak. We're going to hike up Guadalupe Peak. <laughs> I won't say climb. This is a picture of uh, Guadalupe Peak uh, from, uh, this is a little um, rest stop in, uh, that's about 50 miles from Guadalupe Peak. As it, I like this one because the, uh, the fog is just uh, below. And this was a picture is, that I took when we were leaving uh, the Guadalupe Peak uh, National Park. So this is how high we had to go. We had to go to 9,000 feet. When, uh, when we stopped there 
as we were approaching it, uh, it really frightened me. I, uh, it, was, it was fun for a couple of reasons. Go back, go back a slide, would you please, Ian? There we go. I wanna, I've got a point on that next slide. <clears throat> part, of, uh, part of my hesitation was because of what had happened to me three years ago. And my lungs have a little bit of compromise in them. They're, they're not fully functioning. So I didn't know whether I could go up, uh, I could actually hike up the mountain or not. So I prayed about it, I talked to my doctor, and uh, I decided that I, I would go as far as I could go. But of course, you know, I'm the type A personality that I am and controlling personality that I am. I was going to make it to the top. I was going to go to the top. I was going to make it all the way. Now, one of the other things that happened during this time is that we decided that we could take, this would be a trip where we could take our sons. And I, have, and I took my oldest son, who is 29, I took him with me. I took Ben with me. We started out, okay, next slide. We started out, and uh, this is what it looks like. See, the, these are steps. And this is, we did four hours of this. Yeah, it's like being on a Stairmaster for four hours straight. My gluteal muscles are just the most amazing things in the world right now. <laughs> They're going to slowly go back to normal, but uh, I feel like, like this cow. And anyway, at four hours of going upwards, and I don't know if any of you uh, know, but it works your lungs a little bit harder, and uh, it, was, it was difficult for me. Uh, I was exhausted. And uh, as, as you know, I have to work harder to breathe than, than you all. My son, Ben, stayed by me the whole time. And uh, I would tell him, uh, every now and then I would stop, I would stop and breathe, and I would tell him, you, on, you go on ahead, you go, on, you go and finish. And he would say, no, I like your pace. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, well, if you want to do that, that's fine. He stayed, he, ben stayed at my side the whole time. But my goal was to make it to the top. My goal would, was to get to the top of Guadalupe Peak, the highest point in Texas, and to survey all the kingdoms of the world. And uh, that's an allusion to Jesus' temptations. To survey all the kingdoms of the world and to say, I'm the king of the world. I, I wanted to do that. I didn't make it. We stopped to rest and eat, and I realized that uh, there was about a 45-minute hike that I just couldn't do. I, I was exhausted. I couldn't, couldn't do it. I couldn't reach the peak. So I sent Ben on up, and he went, and he finished his climb. I sat down on a rock, and I waited for him to come back down, and I started crying. At first, I cried because I'd, I had missed my goal. And you know, I, I, I'm kind of a driven person, and I, I've got that type A personality. And I cried because I didn't make it to the top. I cried because I didn't make it to the top with my son. Friends, that was my ego talking. I was sorry for myself. I was self-pitying. I was self-centered. And I felt superior to all those other people that were hiking on up, and I was sitting where I was sitting. I started thinking about that, and of course I knew I was preaching this sermon this Sunday. And as I was thinking, I started crying again, second time. This was my view. This is actually a picture that I took. This is the rock that I was sitting on, and this is the view. So I was at about 8,000 feet. I cried the second time because I was there. Three years ago, I would not have been there. I was there sitting on a rock at about 8,000 feet, admiring the view after basically climbing stairs for four hours straight and stressing my lungs to an extreme and still being able to breathe and live and function and love. I cried first because I couldn't do what others could do. I cried first because I couldn't feel better than others. I cried second because I realized how grateful I am to God for life, for healing to this point, and for friends who go with me on the journey. Give it up. Superiority. Oh, this is, this is Ben and me. This is my son. He looks like a much younger version of me. <laughs> only a lot better looking. He's got his Texas Tech cap. You, know, you notice I didn't tell any Texas Tech jokes, so uh, when he comes and visits, I want you to tell him that I, I spared him. Give it up. Superiority. Instead,
Focus on the journey that God places before us. And give thanks to God for the companions that he gives us for that journey. Amen.